Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Welcome to the Dynamic Coalition on the Sustainability of Journalism and News Media. Uh, our topic today is Unbreaking the News, Media Sustainability in the Digital Age. Uh, the nexus between long-term long news sustainability and internet governance is more undeniable than ever. How are internet policies affecting the ability of news organizations and journalists to sustain public interest journalism in the post-pandemic world? What can we expect from proposals to tack technology platforms to fund news media? And how do online advertising business models affect both internet governance and digital journalism? These are some of the questions that we're here uh, to talk about today, and it's really a pleasure to see you all here. My name is Daniel O'Malley. I'm from the Center for International Media Assistance in Washington, DC. And I am one of the co-coordinators of this dynamic coalition alongside Courtney Ratch, who is joining us virtually from California, and Wakas Naim, who is joining us from Pakistan online as well. Uh, we have a really uh, great session for you. We, ha we are going to start uh, with a, an interactive panel of three uh, specialists in this area, uh, Courtney Ratch, Anya Schifrin, and Michal Isabrenner from Sembra Media. Uh, so that will last about 30 minutes, then we'll have an open session where members of our dynamic coalition will be able to share some of the news and research that they've been working on over the past year. Uh, and then finally, we'll have an open discussion with all the participants in the room. Um, but before we get started, before we get started with the panel discussion, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the dynamic coalition. Um, our key functions as a, a part of the, the IGF system are one, to inform internet governance community about the cha challenges to journalism in the digital age, to disseminate information uh, with our existing stakeholders uh, through articles, blog posts, research. We also publish an annual report on these topics. And we're also uh, a dynamic coalition that seeks to advocate for the voices of the journalist sector uh, in broader digital policy discussions. So we're an active and open multi-stakeholder uh, forum. If you, we're always looking for uh, more people to join us. We have a host of activities lined up for 2023, and we'd love to have more voices in our Dynamic Coalition. So I'd urge you to check out our website, which is on the IGF website, and sign up for the listserv so you can make sure to, to learn about the learning calls that we're organizing, um, as well as other, uh, other uh, activities throughout the year, including at RightsCon and such. Um, now it's going to be my honor to pass this over to Wakas, my co-coordinator for the Dynamics uh, Coalition, who is going to be moderating our, our panel discussion that will get started. So Wakas, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and greetings to everybody who is in the room in Addis Ababa. I hope that you've had a productive IGF so far, and I hope that uh, you find our a discussion today uh, useful. Um, a warm welcome to everyone who's also joined us online. Uh, please free, feel free to use the chat function to share your comments and uh, post your questions. Uh, we'll hopefully get your questions right at the end of the session when we have uh, time allocated for Q&A. Um, thank you, Dan, also for an excellent introduction to uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Sustainability. Um, our colleague, Laura, has uh, posted a link uh, to the coalition uh, in the chat. Um, I'm sure that we can make the link available to, um, uh, to, our, to our participants on site uh, in the conference room. Um, our panel discussion today uh, will tease out the links between internet governance and media sustainability by examining trends in uh, the practices of digital native media organizations, as well as regulatory frameworks that may create new revenue streams for journalism. Um, our discussion is organized around three themes. Uh, and I'm really proud to say that we have three illustrious guest speakers on the panel today, um, whom um, uh, Dan has um, uh, mentioned. Uh, but I'll also briefly introduce them along with the themes uh, we'll talk about today. Uh, we have with us first Mihal Estrebna, the co founder and executive director of Sembra Media, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping digital media entrepreneurs to build more sustainable and independent media organizations. Mihal herself is a journalist and entrepreneur, and as a specialist, she has helped hundreds of journalism startups with management fundamentals and sustainability. We're going to speak to her uh, about the sustainability uh, of independent digital native media organizations. It's Thankful that you've joined us. 
today. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Courtney Raj, a journalist, scholar, and free expression advocate uh, who writes and speaks about the nexus of technology media and policy. Her work focuses on issues of tech policy and human rights, internet governance, and of course, media sustainability and the future of journalism. Uh, she's a fellow at the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. Welcome, Courtney. Uh, we hope to speak with you today about the policy interventions for platform payments to news publishers. And finally, um, uh, we hope uh, to be shortly joined by Anya Shifrin, the Director of Technology, Media and Communications at Columbia University's School of International Public Affairs and a lecturer who teaches global media, innovation and human rights and writes prolifically on journalism and development topics. Uh, and we hope to speak with her about uh, enforcement experiences of regulatory frameworks that may potentially benefit uh, media sustainability. Uh, Mihal, I'll begin with you. Um, Semra Media published um, the Inflection Point International Study just over a year ago. Uh, and I think most of us in the media development sector um, have benefited greatly from the findings of this, this report uh, during the past year um, because of its uh, rich insights uh, about digital native media organizations um, from Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Uh, the report uh, relied on over 200 interviews uh, with media organizations from these three regions um, and included media organizations that are producing you know, significant public interest journalism work despite threats to their safety. Uh, one very important finding uh, from the Inflection Point International Study uh, was about the sources of revenue for digital native media. Uh, and the study highlighted that grant funding uh, was a leading source across all media regions, uh, followed closely by ad revenue. Uh, my question to you is, how do you see these trends holding up during 2022? Um, uh, and do you feel uh, there are risks involved in uh, digital native media over relying on donor grant funding, especially as we are sort of moving out of the pandemic slowly. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you and everyone for attending this uh, special and really meaningful uh, panel. And I want to thank Sima and Luminate for the support they provide for this report. Um, the grant influence is still really high in 2020, at least in Latin America. We've just seen that uh, we are ending this year with a lot of influence from grant money. But this might change during the next few years if grant money from tech corporations leave the sector. Um, since our first inflection point published in 2017, we've been recommending to media grant funders to be careful with, with withdrawing abruptly because that could kill the media they've been financing. Grant dependency is such a problem as membership only dependency. Over the last seven years of research at Sembra Media, we've confirmed over and over again that diversification is key to sustainability, especially for digital business model models. Um, an ecosystem where the rules and the user behaviors changes super fast. Sembra Media also acts like a grantor in acceleration program. Not only we advise grantors to provide extra holistic support along with funding, but we also recommend avoiding teaching those media to burn their money in a short amount of time. This is a really bad practice and it happens a lot because the grant programs have a timeline, they have a start and an end date, so sometimes grantors forget to teach the media to be super aware of spending the money wisely. Uh, this is why after the acceleration ends, uh, we at Sembra Media extend that timeline for them to spend our core money. And we recommend creating their own emergency fund if they can. Uh, we always expect that at least 10% of their grant money should be overhead. Uh, for them to learn to replicate that with clients and build their own reserves. So this is something they should do with all the different revenue sources, not only the grants. Um, and the problem is not over the spending on grants, it's over the spending on just one, just one uh, revenue source. Thank you so much, Mihal. Um, over over to you, Courtney. 
Um, we've just heard about some of the traditional revenue streams and about the importance of diversification. Um, but your recent report uh, published by SEMA titled Making Big Tech Pay for the News They Use. Um, in that report, you discuss three key policy interventions that are trying to compel tech platforms uh, to pay news publishers. Could you please walk us through these three interventions and also your impressions of, you know, what are the key issues in implementing these approaches, um, especially in the context of uh, internet governance? Sure, thanks so much for the invitation today. Um, so yes, in the report that I wrote for SEMA, I explored three primary intervention policy interventions that are aimed at rebalancing what is seen as um, a really unequal relationship between digital platforms and the news media that depend on those platforms to reach their audience, to monetize, um, and to just kind of exist in the 21st century. And so those specifically are taxation, usually taxation of digital advertising, competition policy, and that's looking at antitrust interventions such as um, giving news media the right to collectively bargain but bypassing antitrust interventions or antitrust interventions aimed at the platforms such as um, antitrust interventions to rebalance the, the imbalance in the digital advertising ecosystem where Google and Facebook dominate about 90% of that and control not just kind of the advertising um, market, but the entire infrastructure on which digital advertising is built. A uh, very complicated and opaque infrastructure with lots of intermediaries, but which is dominated by, um, by tech platforms. Um, and then also looking at intellectual property interventions, and this includes new licensing and copyright um, frameworks. So copyright, the idea of ancillary or neighboring uh, rights for copyright, which is essentially the idea that publishers also uh, retain copyright over published materials. So news publishers having the right to therefore license their content if they own copyright over it, um, and then being able to charge a fee uh, for the use of snippets, for example. Um, there are also subsidy interventions, which are both direct and indirect, which I didn't get into so much in the report, but that's also something that's looking at, looked at. And all of it is about um, how can regulators think about either taking some of the, the funds, the, the money that um, platforms have in record profit-breaking years until this year, um, and redistribute a small, tiny fraction of that. Um, at, or looking at the power that these platforms have and trying to redistribute a tiny fraction of that back to the news media. Um, I think you know what we saw, for example, in Australia was it really got people interested in these types of interventions. Australia passed the news media bargaining code, which gave the news media the right to collectively bargain. Well, and to, sorry, gave the news media the right to bargain um, and license their content to tech platforms and forces mandatory arbitration um, with those tech platforms if they don't agree to um, to uh, negotiate. And it also implemented some things like algorithmic transparency um, in certain instances where major technology updates um, to either algorithms or policy changes, for example, favoring video, defavoring, you know, um, information by organizations, that sort of thing would be conveyed in advance to those um, news organizations. And that so far has had actually a pretty good impact. Um, we have seen some assessments done. They are, you know, actually I would say Australia is a really excellent case because they're actually doing a review right now to assess the impact. And um, one of the big challenges of the Australian approach is the lack of transparency into the licensing deals. And that is being addressed in other legislation around the world that is kind of looking at the Australian model and, and thinking about implementing similar legislation in Canada, um, in India, in the United States, or taking portions um, of that approach. Europe has focused on updating its uh, copyright policy um, and its copyright directive rather, and providing again for these ancillary rights and then creating frameworks for negotiating um, at the individual outlet or collective outlet level um, with, with the tech platforms. So I think that uh, there's been a lot of criticism of that about the potential to break the internet. Um, critics have called that the link tax 
so far we have not seen that the internet is broken um, but I think that we are still concerned about the lack of transparency and so um, some of the interventions that are being considered, including uh, in the United States, which probably has the most power to mandate transparency over the platforms that are most central to the news industry, um, there are considerations for mandating transparency, which we absolutely need because one of the big takeaways from all of these interventions is they're happening in an information vacuum. There is a lack of data about the link between advertising and revenue, about um, the about how different types of interventions by tech platforms impact the ability of news media to monetize um, and kind of the value of news. There's a big disagreement about whether there is, you know, kind of the the monetary value of news, which Facebook and Google claim is not very large, and then Australia's um, competition authority and others who have intervened about, you know, both the actual cost of news. Um, but also the kind of inherent value of news and what that brings to the platforms. And I have to say, if you look at the amount of money that platforms are spending on fact checking, which is essentially another word for journalism, um, I think that we can see there is a lot of value to factual um, reported information. So um, let me leave it with that and happy to get into more of the details. Thank you so much, Courtney, uh, for that level of detail. And I think that gives us a very nice segue um, to our question uh, to Anya Schifrin, who has uh, joined us um, online. Um, welcome, Anya, um, and thank you so much for uh, posting the link to your uh, Saving Journalism report series in the chat. Uh, my question is related to your um, reflections and observations regarding Australia's uh, news media bargaining code. Um, as Courtney mentioned, um, there has been some reporting on potential benefits from the code uh, to Australia's news media organizations. Um, how do you see uh, this success? Uh, are we being over optimistic about the code's benefits um, and its sort of potential um, replication around the world? Uh, or is there really um, you know, reason to be confident? Oh, thank you very much for having me, and what you know, great to be with such uh, illustrious colleagues. Really glad to be here. The um, Australian News Media Bargaining Code, I wouldn't say it's for everybody, but I think it's done well for Australia. I think there's a few things to kind of know about it. One is that it was just a very, very practical um, effort. By, the, by a lot of people in Australia. So what happened was the Liberals were the Conservatives and the Greens and pretty much everyone else in between just said, you know what, let's get some money out of Google and Facebook. It may not be forever, it may not be perfect, but let's just do it. And so there was a sort of pragmatic pragmatism to their policy making. And I, I do admire that. I think it's really easy in this situation, we're in a sort of an emergency situation, I think it's really easy to kind of sit back and say, ooh, this isn't perfect, this could have terrible implications. So I think, you know, we have to give them credit for actually just doing something. And of course the worry, you know, always when you design policy to help media, in a way you're designing for the incumbents, not the startups, because the startups don't exist, right? Or you don't know what's gonna come later. So what they said was, yep, Murdoch will get most of the money but we're going to find ways to make sure other people get it too. And that that's actually what happened. I mean, the estimates are something like a couple hundred million dollars have gone into Australian journalism. And then after the first round, um, uh, uh, Mindaroo Foundation, Emma McDonald worked with the smaller outlets so they could get some money as well. So at this point, you know, nearly all of the Australian outlets have gotten some kind of money. They're doing a lot of hiring in fact, um, so they've created a lot of jobs. Again, you know, lack of transparency, we don't know what they're spending their money on. Um, and some people have been sort of monitoring the want ads to see who's hiring and who maybe spent the money on something else. The Treasury, by under Australian law, the Treasury has to do a review of the code and that just came out today or yesterday, I guess, in Australian time. And they found it's largely a success. Um, Google has given has negotiated with more outlets than Meta, and there was talk about maybe they would designate Meta, which means they would require them um, to go into negotiations, but they haven't. 
And um, I think they're now looking at TikTok and wondering, you know, what, who else should be included in the fold. So it was a super pragmatic, it's not the perfect solution, but it raised a bunch of money in, in the short term. Um, I think that, you know, I was looking a little bit at Gabby Miller's piece on the Canadian bill, which I think pro I could put a link to that in the chat, which Courtney touched on. One of the improvements of the Canadian bill is that there would be a requirement for the news outlets to at least report to government uh, what, you know, what they're getting. And that's not the full transparency that a lot of people would like but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And I think there's still disagreement, and we've been talking about this a lot in the US, of whether or not there should be requirements or conditions put on the outlets that receive money. For example, saying you have to cap executive pay or you have to put the money into journalism. Um, I mean, funds are fungible, so it, it's a little bit hard to make those requirements, but I don't see why you couldn't try. Dean Baker says, you know, if you're getting a bunch of money under some sort of government um, law, like the Journalism Competition uh, Preservation Act, then you should not be allowed to have a paywall, for example, because the idea is if you're getting a subsidy for the information, it should be it should be made available to everybody. So yeah, I don't think it's like the perfect solution for everyone. I think it's worked really well for Australia, and I think it's absolutely worth um, considering. You know, I see in the chat people are saying, well, we shouldn't take tech money because of surveillance economy. Um, but, you know, all money comes with risks, right? Whether it's advertising money, whether it's subscription money, whether it's um, money from foundations, all of those have risks. We have a lot of academic literature on the risks of all of those. Um, I think uh, another point to make about what happened in Australia was it wasn't just the bargaining code. They also put money into saving uh, the Australian Newswire. They've given a whole range of grants. So it was part of a package of measures. And, you know, I have to say that that's, that, that's admirable. Um, so, yeah, so, so that's my take on that. I think also to the person in the comment who's talking about surveillance capitalism, I mean, another problem about all these companies is they're actually not paying taxes very much. I mean, they're really not paying taxes, right? And we know how they put their headquarters in countries so they don't pay taxes, et cetera. So, or they minimize their tax burden, and this is true of all of them. So if we tax them, we'd be taking their money as well. So perhaps it's not the collection, it's how that money is dispersed. And that's why economists don't really like earmarked taxes. They would much rather see all the money go into the government tax pile, pod, and then figure out you know, who gets what, that earmarked taxes are, are risky. So I don't know whether the folks in the comments you know, would, would find that acceptable, or if you're just saying there should be any taxation either. Um, and obviously Courtney's point about copyright is also incredibly important. And, and I think one way to look at it, you know, the argument of the platforms in my last comment is that uh, they're driving traffic to the websites or to the outlets and it's the outlet's fault if they can't monetize it. And I would rather look at it another way, which is what economists call cream skimming. If you take the headline off the story and the first few lines and make it available on Google, then you've actually taken the very best part of the, of the news item and you've diminished the value of what remains. So I always tell my students, it's like imagine someone comes along with a cupcake or a muffin and they take the yummy top and they eat that and then they leave behind the old dry part at the bottom and they say to everybody, well, not your fault if you can't sell the old dry part. That's what cream skimming is and that's essentially what the tech companies do when they take the highlights of the news items. So I, th I think their whole thing about we drive traffic, like they've got a point, but there's also other ways to look at it. Thank you, Anya, that's a great analogy. Um, and, and I think we need more discussions about sort of the ethical dimensions of you know uh, this money and how um, news organizations around the world can use it. I, we'll talk um, uh, shortly about the regulatory disparity and obviously the different circumstances um, in you know news markets around the world um, who might not have the same capacity as maybe Australia or Canada uh, to implement some of these approaches. Uh, but I'll pick on one point that you made um, uh, that's 
you know, when policy is made, it's usually for the incumbents and it's not for the startups. Um, as, as a former journalist, I feel that, you know, startups, especially in the global south, need the most support because these are media organizations that are really focusing on a public interest journalism and reaching out to, you know, reporting on marginalized communities, um, improving their access to information. So, Mihal, I'll come back to you. I think this is an opportunity for us to also give out some practical advice related to media sustainability using our platform today. Um, another finding of the inflection point in national study was that most digital ne native media organizations fall into the bottom tiers in terms of business maturity. So they might have a low initial investment and you know very little financial security. Um, in, especially in the context of you know these policies um, not really uh, being addressed to them or not really supporting them maybe from the get-go and also your earlier point about diversification what advice would you have for founders and teams of digital native media organizations that are really starting in the bottom tier yeah uh, many of the journalists who start new media have almost no knowledge about business and might ha might have never had a conversation with another entrepreneur uh previous to funding their own um, those two key elements are key for them to make a couple of really important judgments. Um, the business maturity has a greater correlation with management than with the initial investment. Uh, sweat equity is really common among social entrepreneurs, not only journalists. Uh, but the lack of skills and knowledge about how to build an interdisciplinary team ready to grow with the organization relevance and social impact is still something that the minority um, of the entrepreneurs thinks at the founding phase. Um, it is possible that if media leaders had a better understanding of what building a social startup entails, they will also be more proactive and more skilled in looking for more initial investment. Um, our recommendation for media entrepreneurs out there is to plan your goals uh, with a clear social purpose in mind, spend time communicating it to your team, building processes, looking for talent, and planning for growth. Um, sustainability isn't money at the bank. It is your ability to plan your development five years ahead. And I. Um, really think that um, I agree that many of these policies are built for uh, long lasting uh, media um, companies and traditional media, but uh, the social role that these um, media startups, not all, all of the digital media we, we study are startups, some of them are like 10 years old, um, but these media um, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, they they actually change the course of the laws. Uh, they change the course of the life of their communities and they are key to avoid having so many, um, uh, um, so, so uh, much uh, disinformation spreading and uh, these uh, different informational oases that we've seen uh, in the last decade. So um, I do think there's it's important to think uh, what type of policy we can develop around this specific growth because our industry is under a uh, huge employment crisis. The different type of uh, job descriptions and the, the roles we need in the media are different. The skills are different. And many of the most uh, prepared and, and really committed journalists are starting their own media or are, have already started their own media. And our journalistic students are gonna, well, gonna have to create their own media to be able to work and to, to, to uh, accomplish their uh, purposes as journalists. So um, I think it's important to start thinking now what type of policy we'll develop for this um important uh independent uh journalistic group to 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 thrive thank you mihal 
Um, I'll take your comments and uh, address my next question to uh, Courtney, um, especially in sort of in the context of what Mihal said, uh, talking about, you know, digital native independent media organizations um, in countries of the global south where we may not have, um, you know, well-developed news markets and news media organizations are also hard pressed by authoritarian regimes or, you know, bad faith actors. Um, you've mentioned this regulatory disparity uh, in your report, in your recommendations. What do you think are specific recommendations when it comes to these kinds of policies um, of compelling tech platforms uh, to pay news publishers in sort of the broader global context? You've already sort of touched up, uh, upon this, uh, but really with a focus on policymakers and media organizations in the global south, um, do you think there are steps that they can take so I think first off, I mean, as Michal suggested, you know, a lot of news organizations um, in the global south or small alternative non-English speaking um, news outlets are particularly struggling in the platform era. And um, you hear a lot, especially in the U.S. Um, about, you know, well, if they can't make money, well, that that's their fault. I think we have to recognize that in many parts of the world where um, internet connectivity was later, where mobile penetration now is a main way that people get their news, et cetera, you know, these news organizations are playing, have a constrained playing field on which they're, you know, on which they're playing. The playing field has been created by these global north dominant platforms. The rules of the game are set. It's really hard to play by other rules, especially as you suggested in countries where there are restrictions on access to information or restrictions on independent journalism, um, not to mention just you know less developed countries where the economies make it really hard for them to participate in these global platforms because they don't have globally exchangeable currencies. They don't have access to credit cards um, to you know do subscription programs or to participate in the you know in AdSense or or these other things. You know one of the things I heard because um, I've, I've been doing a lot of reporting. Um, over the past year and talking to um, journalists, independent journalists and media um, outlets around the world. And, you know, I hear a lot, one of the easiest things would just be increase the payments for AdSense because that is a direct, like pretty easy to implement. Um, the policy interventions that we're talking about here, for example, licensing and copyright interventions or news media um, bargaining codes require a lot of kind of background undergirding infrastructure to implement. So if you want to have a licensing program, think about like digital music. You have to track that. You have to figure out, first of all, define who benefits. That definition is really susceptible to media capture, to capture by political actors, um, by platforms. Um, so that's a risk. Um, similarly, then you have to have collecting agencies, you have to have this whole digital infrastructure on the back end. Um, I still have not figured out how you would be able to track the use of text headlines. You know, um, the way that digital music works is you, know, you can use hashes. There is a multimedia image. It's much different when we're talking about text. And I just want to head off, you know, make a side note to head off some criticism about, you know, allowing news organizations to convey copyright over their headlines because those are facts. A lot of times headlines are not just facts. Investigative reporting costs, you know, can cost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, takes take years, you know, transnational collaborations to 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 do. And yet if you give the headline out, you've just kind of like, you know, given all of this information um, for free that costs a lot to get, right? So if we think about the Paradise Papers or the Panama Papers, so I think we have to be a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more realistic about that. Um, you know, the other thing is you need to have a, a level of trust to implement these policies or a level of checks and balances, good governance, and trust in the system, even if you don't have trust in yourselves. So if you're going to create, you know, a news media bargaining unit, um, or you're going to uh, create a collecting, you know, a, a collecting society, you have to have some level of trust that it's going to be implemented, that that collecting society is going to accurately track um, the use of the material, give that money back to the players, 
Um, you need to have trust in the government as well that they're going to distribute any sort of taxation that has been, uh, you know, generated through all of this. And, and that can be a really hard sell in a lot of countries, um, especially where there is a lack of kind of democratic uh, infrastructure and checks and balances to make sure that happens. Um, and I mean, similarly, I think that um, one of the, as I alluded to earlier, one of the big challenges is this kind of lack of data um, but there's also this challenge that we might get data and find out that actually, you know, maybe news is only 3% of the platform, which is what Facebook goes around claiming all of the time. Um, but I think that that is the wrong way to look at this issue. And I think, you know, to kind of allude to some of the discussion in the chat is thinking about um, especially Google and Facebook these right now, but those those may change like the primary platforms for journalism is journalism as a public good. Um, and so thinking about the new independent news and journalism as a public good can help us rethink how we want to balance that relationship, what factors um, and, and kind of the economic analysis that we're doing to think about whether this is the right sort of intervention or not. I think the fact that the OECD has adopted this 15% minimum tax on major global corporations to Anya's point um, could be helpful in just getting them to pay their fair share of taxes. I think that remains a challenge for a lot of developing countries around the world is just getting the um, digital services to pay taxes at all. And so that could go um, pretty far. But I think basically it's going to be a really challenge. It's going to be very challenging for many developing countries, um, many countries that are in the majority world, also known as the global south, to implement these sort of policies because they don't necessarily even have you know, copyright laws in place that would allow this. They don't have the kind of the the governance infrastructure um, needed to implement some of these these policies. And so, look, I think that that makes global north, especially the U.S. as well as Europe, responsible for having to think outside of their boundaries. I know we don't usually make policies in a specific country looking at other countries, but I think this is a case where the United States in particular and Europe as the um, area where you actually see meaningful policy being made to govern tech platforms. Um, we have to think about the news media around the world and the impact that these policies will have on news media, not just in a specific country, but around the world, because it is a global public good. And it is something, um, you know, when there there's an outbreak of a disease or there is a natural disaster or, you know, elections um, or just, you know, humanity needs this reporting. It needs the accountability that independent media bring. And so that should be something that we are looking at, I believe, globally. Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, I'll give um, Anya the floor uh, for a final intervention. I had a question for you, but we are almost running out of time. Uh, but you wanted to make a point earlier. And if you want to add anything to the questions Sorry, in the chat. Was, go ahead. And what was the question? Sorry. My question, my question was about, um, you know, us looking at this regulatory disparity. Mm -hmm. We've already talked about mm -hmm. Canada's Online News Act. You've mentioned yeah. that, um, but looking at other countries around the world where we might not even have the political will uh, to bring about, you know, such policy decisions. Do you yeah. think there are other solutions yeah. that media or policymakers can explore? Yeah, that's exactly what I would have talked about anyway. Great. I thought Michal's point was super interesting. And what I found when I was researching um, my report, Saving Journalism, was whenever I talked to a journalist from Africa or Latin America and said, hey, what do you think about all these ideas countries are trying, right? Like Indonesia giving tax cuts to journalism or funding, subsidizing outlets that were writing, you know, solution stories about COVID or COVID and Tunisia giving tax cuts. A lot of the research that came out when we were doing the UNESCO report for Guy um, done by the folks from The Economist. So there were all these ideas happening all over the place, including, you know, South Korea was looking at introducing a subscription voucher, which I know a lot of people are interested in. And if anybody knows someone who's done it, please let me know, because there's a bit of a discussion about that right now. Anyway, every time I asked a journalist um, from Africa or Latin America, they said, oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want any of this. We don't want a tax credit. We don't want government advertising. All of this is going to compromise our independence. And I'm like, OK, you're getting money from George Soros. You're getting money from Bill Gates. You're getting money from foreign governments. But you don't even want to be on a list of who might get a tax credit. 
And the point is, nope, because that just gives the government too much influence. And anyway, we're too small. We're not paying taxes anyway. So I do think there's absolutely policies that can help quality information and journalism, even in countries that are you know, less democratic, but I think they're gonna be different policies, right? So to Courtney's, you know, point, who spent years in, at the Committee to Protect Journalists, you know, one of them is press freedom, do no harm, or, um, you know, maybe limited interventions. I mean, I, I was just talking to Franz Kruger in South Africa, who's just done a comparative look at the um, Argentine, Swedish, I think a Norwegian journalism funds. And, you know, according to him, the Argentine one sort of had its peaks and troughs, but people made an effort and it, and it started to work again. And ditto, you know, the Tanzania media fund. So I don't want to say that there's no role for anyone to play in the global south and we have to leave everybody to just, you know, carve out money where they can. But I, I absolutely agree that I think the policies will be different. And um, Guy's point about what can outlets do with audience data you know my understanding from the u.s companies that i talk to is that it's really really surveillance capitalism at its most right like they're trying to you know disney is trying to get you know gets all your data and then tries to sell you stuff and then tracks what you're buying so i don't know that media outlets use of data is any more kind of lovable and pure than than anybody else's except that you know i don't do ad blockers etc because i don't mind i want the new york times to have my data because i know they need money so i'm willing to give it to them in a way that i don't feel comfortable giving it to i don't know amazon or something like that but anyway great discussion um and i'll mute here and and thank you thank you so much anya um and and thank you so much to all of our speakers for um very important interventions today. Uh, also, thank you for addressing some of the questions that we were receiving in chat. Um, I'll now hand it over to Dan, um, who's been anxiously and patiently waiting uh, in the conference room. Um, and I'm sure that there are many people there um, who also want to chip in um, with their comments uh, to the discussion. So Dan, if you can hear us, please uh, take it away. Great, thank you, Wakas. And, and thank you, Courtney, Anya, and Michal for some really great and incisive points. And um, yes, I can tell that people in the room are kind of chomping at the bit here. So we want to continue this conversation. So, uh, you know, if any of our speakers or anyone online wants to jump in uh, at, at a later point, uh, let's make sure to continue this conversation. I think we've raised already some really interesting points about platform power, about um, how do we build for startups versus incumbents, about what the policies might look like in different places. And I think, you know, one of the objectives of the this DC sustainability is currently Currently, this working group is, you know, currently it often feels like we're going from one location to another. It's like, oh, everyone's focused on Australia, what's going on there, and then it goes to Canada. And I think one of the things that's really beneficial about these types of communities is we can think more globally, think beyond boundaries, as Courtney was mentioning. So uh, we're now going to uh, seg into the part of our session where people here, uh, including members of our dynamic coalition, are going to be able to um, talk about some of the research as it intersects with the, the, the uh, issues that uh, our speakers have brought up. We have a couple people lined up, but I know that there are other people here with expertise who may want to intervene as well. Um, so please take that in mind and, and, and get in the queue. I'm going to pass it first to uh, uh, Hazlan uh, Urslu, Handan Urslu from Turkish Internet Observatory. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Dan. Um, so. Um, Firstly, I would, I'll probably give a lot of data that will really conflict with all of the things that speakers said, so apologies for that in the beginning, but I just want to start with one small data. So uh, according to SEMrush.com, New York Times is receiving 184 million clicks in a month versus the Tur Turkey's biggest newspaper, which re receives 311 million. So how come does uh, a newspaper from a, from a country of 80 million people is giving tw getting twice as much traffic than New York Times, which is one of the best newspapers in the world, and it's in English. So what happens? So I'm going to change all of the conversation from the news media versus platforms 
to the ideological distribution that Google and platforms do when it comes to distributing money, which we think is way more important. So who, who are we? So we are Turkey's intern observatory, so we are ex-Google, ex-Big Tech workers who were inside of the system, who tried to change the system, but now we're somehow in part as part of the civil society, right? We identified suicidal songs were promoted in Spotify's algorithms. We identified political uh, operations that took place. We identified that Instagram was micro-targeting uh, posts that promoted hate on the streets and um, so th there's a lot of things that Big Tank is doing wrong, right? So however, when you look at the United States, you do have certain mechanisms to hold these companies accountable. So when, uh, so when there was a election interference that took place in 2016, it was all over the news and Facebook had to take certain actions and brought transparency to political advertising, for example. But when it comes to Turkey, we are always left with Google's decisions and what happens to our citizens and our democracy when these platforms do not care. And they do not quite care, right? So when you look at the trust and safety teams, how many Turkish people were working on that, I'm not allowed to say it, but if you look at the job description, you will see that zero people were hired in the last three years. So these companies are multi-billion dollar. They have all kinds of resources to just hire thousands of people like that, hire the best people and kind of solo all of these issues. So, um, so the, this website that I mentioned, it has 300, um, million clicks in a month. That's what SEMrush.com data says. There are a lot of websites in Turkey, and these are mostly pro-government. So sometimes there are a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of hate speech. Sometimes it's not even news that really happens. So we see that there are a lot of, um, a lot of money going through, actually, to mainstream websites. The money is actually there. We think it's just going to the wrong people. So we estimate that about $10 million go to pro-government websites based off of Google. Um, so, so when we look at w what can journalists do, right, and what happens, and so w we feel like we have to look at the bigger search volume and, and the ecosystem, right? So how do you think New York Times is making money? Again, according to SEMrush.com, 20% of New York Times click income comes from the search world, Wordle. It doesn't come from news. Newspapers do not earn money in Google out of news. It's 90% just other, rank, other keywords. However, there's a ranking algorithm in Google that just promotes news websites. So if you put any type of text, a news website is going to come up. And if you are mainstream, and if you're mostly pro-government, you're going to rank first. And that's what technology does. Technology is never neutral. It is always promoting those in power. And those are the newspapers that were up there for 50 years who has a lot of backlinks. So even if you, you're as a journalist, even if you trained a journalist to do good SEO search engine optimization and keyword change, it's just not going to happen. You have to put a lot, a lot of marketing money to get backlinks, to do hack links, to actually rank in Google. So that's number one thing. And how do newspapers in Turkey get money? So there's a lot of inflation. So millions of people just Google how much is a dollar. That's 30% of that $6 million per month coming from, is how much is a dollar. Should we really train a journalist? Is it really the journalist problem? Is Google giving money to journalists because they're doing news? Or is this just like a bad ranking mechanism? So if you look at this, all of the, this big issue, um, you see that search engine optimization and bigger volume gives us a quite different picture. So again, when we come down to uh, policies, right? We always think about what the government can do, but we should really think about the product policy, which is a decision inside Google that kind of decides who gets the money, right? And, and what we have is a doorway policy in Google. You can you got it at the search. Uh, results uh, at the search spam policies, which is not implemented. Because this policy is quite rigid. They either take you off Google or not, and they just can't take off big websites, and they haven't invested on accountability. So even if you do some doorway spam, it, it's just going to pass through. It really boils down to this small technical decisions and how many people were hired to reduce spam in Google. So who does Google's news initiative give funding to? The biggest pro-government website in Turkey. That is where the funding is going to. And, and then again, again, when we look at all of um, these volumes. So again, one of the key things that people search online is pornography. That is the reality. That's a lot of, a lot of traffic. However, in Turkey, pornography websites are banned. So this means that we don't have pornhub.com or like any kind of regulated website that will come up. So what we see is a lot of websites optimizing for porn keywords. So when you Google porn, again, mainstream media comes up and Google gives money. 
they are earning money just because there is a pornography ban in Turkey. So we should really look at how the policies interact, the government's policies and the news policies. Um, so, so this is actually what we have to say, is that firstly, um, wh when we think about policies, we should really look at what, what the product is being doing, the product policy, that's number one. <coughs> number two, technology companies are never neutral. Number three, Google is the biggest funder of pro-government websites globally. We should look at how much money is going there. And we are engineers and we are data analysts, so please don't um, hesitate to contact some SEO specialists or engineers to really understand where the data is coming from, because if we feel like if we can come together as um, these people, but also a bit more technical expertise, some hack linkers, some, uh, some black hat SEO people and get their insight, you'll get a quite a different picture. Um, yeah, and I was very excited to talk about this because um, this was a dialogue that we really wanted to bring to, to this stage with these people who are really working on this. So thank you so much again, Dan, for this. Great, great. Thank you so much for that. And it, it is always uh, really great to have people with different backgrounds and different expertise because it's that kind of multi, uh, you know, uh, interdisciplinary work that can help us solve some of these really intractable problems that we're dealing with. I'm now going to pass it to uh, Lema. And also, before I do, if anyone else has, uh, is, is wanting to say something, just make sure you uh, signal to me so I can and make to call you after, after Lay's intervention. Lema from RNW Media. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Huh? <laughs> you do. You give a really powerful speech and feels uh, pressure a little bit. <laughs> but uh, I, but I, I, I did love your speech. Uh, my name is Lei Ma, and you can call me Lei. Uh, I origin, originally come from China, but I'm now I'm working uh, as a digital media lead for RNW Media. So when you talk about RNW Media, this name is quite confusing because what is RNW? RNW is actually the Radio Netherlands Worldwide, which is one of the oldest. Uh, radio broadcaster, international radio broadcaster in the world. So, simply speaking, is RNW Media is more like a Dutch version of BBC. <laughs> but uh, I think the history of RNW Media is 75 years is really a best case study is how a traditional media can survive in the digital age. And uh, right now, RNW Media has been transforming from a traditional radio broadcaster into a digital media organization. And then we are working with global change makers to uh, working on with the young people for social change. And uh, we accelerate the impact of global change makers by co-creating youth-centered digital media solutions based on the data insight and also mutual learning experience. So basically, RW Media, we work on both med uh, media development and also media for development. And um, uh, our experience, uh, basically, I want to share two points uh, regarding to the sus uh, sustainability. The first one is uh, the network building is quite essential for the sustainability of the media organization. Uh, I want to share some uh, my personal story because I have been working for RNW Media for 10 years. But I went through the reorganization of RNW Media for three times. And the Radio Netherlands Worldwide has 400 employees when I when I was um, uh, got the job, but later on, because of the funding, because um, uh, our biggest founder is uh, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because of the shrinking of the funding, uh, the, the RW Media from uh, 400 people become more, more like 100 people. And after a second uh, reorganization from 100 people to 50 people, <laughs> so you can see it's a really painful process because we have to let people go. And one recent uh, uh, reorganization is um, before the reorganization, we set up around uh, uh, 10, uh, 12 uh, uh, digital community, digital platforms in different languages, in different countries, focus on different uh, uh, social topics. But because of the shrinking of the government um, funding again, we have to let all these uh, uh, different platforms or different uh, entities uh, from different countries, that we have to let them go because they have to, st they have to stand on their own feet. So which means our partners in India, in Burundi, in China, in whatever countries, they have to register their own entity as a media organization or maybe as an independent media organization or maybe as an NGO. And they have to stand uh, standing on their own feet. I have to say this is a, it was a really painful process because in such p short period of time, just one year, and they have to be find a financial balance and uh, 
uh, they tried a different possibility. I see some of our uh, um, uh, partners, they try, for example, like e-commerce, like uh, they also try the e-learning uh, to make some money, of course, the advertisement, for example. They also provide a different type of media service for different clients to make money. But uh, eventually, the diversify of the source of income is quite important. And based on our experience, why? Because right now, because RW Media, we set up a glo uh, global flagship of a global network of around 18 members from uh, uh, from many countries, from uh, India to Jordan, from uh, uh, Lebanon to our beautiful Ethiopia. So uh, we have 18 members, and uh, their registration, some of them are more like independent media organization, some of them are more like registered as NGO, but they do use the use digital media uh, for social change. Uh, I think the global network is really a place we can share our experience on sustainability, and we share our skills and, uh, and also experience, and also we uh, fundraising together. I think the good thing is uh, about the network building is why it is essential for the sustainability, because it can really facilitate the joint effort between the south to south and also the north to south, south for sustainability. I think this is quite important. My second point is uh, the social media accountability is uh, quite essential for, for the sustainability. And uh, regarding the big techs, I think a, a lot of ex uh, experts and speakers already mentioned on this one. I just want to share one thing uh, we haven't done in, uh, in, in, in the past half year is we decided to focus on the meta uh, advertising policy. <laughs> Why? Because uh, some of our network members they are more like a single topic new uh, media organization. They are focused on, for example, the producing content on sex, reproductive health, and sexual rights issues. They are not a news media organization, but they are still media organization focused on single topic. But the thing is, uh, Meta, because uh, uh, our partners, they have the uh, Meta uh, Facebook account and the Instagram account, they do need they need, do need to promote their content through the, the Facebook ads. But the thing is that Meta uh, advertising policy is not, really is not really friendly to this kind of sex education content creators and also journalists, because they see this kind of content as pornographic information. And uh, this is a quite, uh, yeah, quite a, a, a experience. So basically, uh, from uh, um, half a year ago, we together with the International Center for uh, Intimate Justice, Justice from United States, and we organized a big campaign, and we also did a lot, a lot of research, and we found out that in five years' time, there are almost 2,000 2, advertisements from five, um, uh, our, uh, five members of our, our global network are rejected by the, by the Facebook because of this reason. And we conduct a big campaign, and we also conduct a big campaign in the United States. And finally, our campaign message was reposted by the Hillary Clinton and created a certain pressure for the Meta. That's why around two months ago, Meta decided to change their, update their uh, um, um, uh, advertising policy, which is a big victory for us. But uh, of course, there's still a lot of work to do. And of, uh, we also, for example, working in other countries like in Palestine, we also uh, capture and um, uh, collect digital rights violation, and we also pass on this kind of a digital uh, rights violation case, individual case, to the regional office of Meta, uh, Twitter, and TikTok, and then we enable them to make some positive change. I think this is quite important for sustainability because uh, our global partners, they do need this, this kind of advertising space to grow, to reach to more audience. I think this is quite important. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Leigh. Um, I was wondering if anyone else um, has something to add. Uh, just raise your hand either online or here in the room. Um, but, I, but I just wanted to pick up on one point uh, that Leigh mentioned about the power of networking, and I think that's really important. And I think that when we are able to connect what the experiences of people in different places, we make stronger arguments and can have more data, which is another issue that we've discussed and, and the lack of data. And I think also, um, I just want to tip of the hat to uh, Michal and her organi organization, Sembra Media, who did really great work looking at digital media sustainability in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
and Southeast Asia and Inflection Point 3.0 because I think those types of learnings across region can help inform this, this broader conversation. So I'm going to go to this gentleman here and then uh, back to Handan. So please in, make sure to introduce your, yourself um, before you comment. There you go. Yeah. That's working? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Chris Wild. I'm with Internews, um, and I know we work with probably a number of, of organizations in this in this meeting, and it's just really amazing to hear the discussion and, and so many good ideas. Uh, just a couple of reactions um, to the earlier um, uh, panel discussion on policy, and I think um, the Australia and the Canada and, and, and the platform discussions are really interesting. You know, but it made me think that in terms of media, in terms of policy or regulatory work that we're supporting in many of the countries where we work. Um, it's really focused on on issues like just like freedom of information laws, access to information, journalism protection. We're not even close to, to, to starting, you know, support or there's no doesn't doesn't seem like a lot of demand for for policy or regulatory work of the nature that was was discussed earlier. That's not to say it, it, it does it's not needed. My sense is that it's just a lot of these places it's very early stage um, in terms of the media sustainability aspect of policy. Um, the other thing is is in many, of the, in many of the countries that we work, um, there are, um, you know, there, there are, you know, state-supported media outlets, of course, and there are other outlets that have been captured by other interests. And so we find ourselves working with usually a smaller cadre of truly independent, oftentimes digital um, media outlets. Um, and what I can say is that there is tremendous demand for. Um, skills on just on, on media, ba media business sustainability in the sense that, you know, trying to understand audiences, connect with audiences, um, develop feedback loops, and then monetize that, that, that relationship. Um, and it's not, it's, it's data that they're looking for, but it's very basic data. It's the kind of data I think that's like, you know, surveillance data. It's kind of a different, but it's just, uh, it's probably just a matter of, of the maturity of, of, of the market. Um, but um, anyway, I just wanted to comment that. I mean, it, this is all a tremendous, um, um, feedback and, and, and interesting comments. So thank you. Great. Thanks so much for that. I mean, I um, I hear what you're saying. I mean, my, I, one of the th my reactions would be, I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do here is also think about in these places, thinking about you know the issue of like how do we make sure that it's, we're not just preparing for startups but for incumbents. And so how do we create ecosystems so that in places they don't just have to deal with whatever's built for them, but that we build something for them. So that's one of the reasons I think this this coalition in particular is trying to be really uh, diverse so that we can make sure that um, we take those voices into account. Are we part of the coalition? You can be. <laughs> I don't think we are. Uh, I don't think you are, but you can <laughs> be, and we'd love to have you. We're big fans of Internews. Um, I'm going to pass it to Handan. And could you introduce yourself? There were some people online who wanted to, to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, about me? Yeah, just yes. your name so, and your organization. So yes, I'm I'm Handan. I come from Turkey's Internet uh, Observatory. So we are ex big tech and ex Google workers, and we conduct work on uh, holding technology companies accountable. We also have an algorithmic empowerment program for journalists, actually, uh, that kind of helps them navigate the algorithms. And I just wanted to just compliment what you said: is that we also saw the exact same thing that happened with sexual health educators and journalists. There was an Instagram account called Mental Culturis, which means mental culturis, literally, which was the leading um, sexual education uh, platform done by a really good journalist in Turkey and it got banned twice and this happened after only fans became famous and then Facebook developed a sexual assault, uh, a prostitution solicitation policy. It again I, we feel like boils down to product policy and what's happening inside and afterwards all of these information about how to protect about things about abortion and just basic sexual health issues were banned, even though we saw Pornhub.com's website being alive for such a long time. So I just wanted to compliment that we, we also saw and we, uh, we suffer from this. So we'd love to connect later. Thank you. Dan, we have uh, an online intervention. Great. Do let's go with the online that? intervention and then we'll have, we have one more intervention okay. here. Great. Courtney, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes. So am I unmuted? OK. Um, yes. So I, I just wanted to intervene because I think I think that um, you pointed out a, a couple of really important points, which is the policies of the tech platforms have an outsized influence on the sustainability of news media around the world. And so to the extent that some of our interventions um, in countries that have the power to kind of force compliance by tech platforms. I think that's really important for us to think about. Um, the the issue of, you know, news media being able to, for how we're defining news media, I think in a lot of these 
legal frameworks is pretty narrow. A lot of times it's not including community media. It doesn't include specialized media. This has the potential to disenfranchise um, a lot of small alternative feminist kind of anti-colonial type media. And I think we have to be really careful and, and aware of that. that that's, I think, a, a big challenge of a lot of these frameworks. Um, and, you know, especially when we're thinking about some of the um, audiences, the marginalized communities that most need access to independent information, it is often those communities that aren't better covered by kind of broader, um, bigger news uh, outlets. So I think we need to, to consider that. <clears throat> and to the point about internal company policies um, having, you know, this outsized influence, this is the type of thing that we should be thinking about in some of these transparency mandates. And I think there hasn't been quite enough discussion in terms of thinking about if we're if we're going to mandate transparency from the platforms, which the Digital Services Act does to some extent, it's really focused on content moderation, which is important, but insufficient. We need greater transparency and, and data access into, again, the link between revenue and traffic um, and into a lot of other things. And then just the last point around content moderation, that's another area where um, the policies that are being developed by platforms, as well as by, you know, again, US and Europe, um, probably the UK, some of these other countries that have the, the power to compel tech platforms to comply, we have to look at how our laws are being weaponized to silence independent media. And I have another report coming out shortly um, for the Center for International Governance Innovation that it looks at how US and European copyright laws and um, privacy laws are being weaponized by government actors as well as just moderation mercenaries um, to make a buck to to uh, target independent outlets to silence them with erroneous and false um, copyright claims and because these are automated notices and takedowns um, and and especially a lot of the policies um, the way that they're implemented by platforms end up being very poor in low digital resource languages you know arabic is notorious in that respect and that has an influence on news media's ability to cover things like major political groups in the Middle East. Um, you know, just talking recently to a Tunisian journalist who was saying that every time they try to write about Hamas, which is a you know significant political actor in the region, um, their posts get censored on, on Facebook because um, of some of the AI, I won't go into the details, but I think we need to also be cognizant and intentional about that aspect of things as well. Great. Thank you, Courtney. I think that's a reminder, too, about so often when we're talking about media sustainability, we're talking about advertising revenue and how to, you know, make that channel. But there are these other components of Internet governance, content moderation, algorithmic uh, transparency that actually influence whether uh, news media online are able to survive, able to reach their audience. Um, we have another uh, intervention from here in the audience. Just please be sure to introduce yourself. Introduce myself, indeed. Uh, Courtney, it's Good to see you here again. And Dan, thank you for sending me a text earlier to, to come here. Um, I am, I want to be crystal clear that I'm speaking in my personal capacity. I am not speaking on behalf of my organization. I am speaking on behalf of my individual self. Um, and I actually write product policy for Facebook News. Um, I would love to just hear your follow up and get your contact. I am not promising to do anything or not to do anything, but I do think it's important to have, to have lines of communication so that we can identify opportunities to both collaborate, to understand the issues as you articulate them, and to try to address and create remedies. Again, I'm here as an academic <laughs> to, do re to, to talk about research that I do on connecting people across the continent, um, and Dan just happened to uh, message me. So I just, I, I've heard a number of comments here that I have thoughts on, but, but I'll save those when I put on my meta hat. And so I would love to just follow up with folks if, I mean, I'm truly here in my individual capacity because I don't even have any business cards. I'm li literally here as Yusuf. Um, but I would love to follow up with folks. I think there are a number of issues that have been raised, some of which I think warrant some clarification and some nuance about how we think about some of these issues. Um, there were some comments I think that I thought were important, but um, may also present some misnomers about whether an an entity is registered in a news page index and what registration in the NPI means and how we identify publishers based on the, the introduction to NPI. So some of the issues that were raised are partly because the entity is not in the NPI. 
And so I, I just want to provide a little flavor of context and not provide flavor of context, but also just to say that I'm happy to truly open up lines of communication. With that, I yield the time. Great. Thank you, Youssef. And, and thank you for coming, too, because I think it is really important for this to the Internet Governance Forum in, in its uh, multi-stakeholder. We need to have these types of conversations across private sector, across the government, across civil society. Oftentimes, we're siloed, and that's one of the beauties of this, these conversations. So we've got some more hands up over here. I'm going to go to Abel. Please introduce yourself, and then Usama. Very fascinating conversation. So to add some uh, perspective from Global South, I'm Abel Abella. I am managing editor of Adizebi, one of the emerging media outlets in Ethiopia. So basically, our platform is online, so we are well aware of this, this conversation. So uh, I think the, the Australia approach has lots of collateral damage uh, on the, the te big, big tech companies' policies. So basically, uh, because our uh, media uh, industry was not uh, big enough to, 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 to be independent, so we are uh, mostly rely on social media platforms. So we can't uh, take our audience to our platform. We have to, uh, we'll get our audience through social media, it's almost 100%, I can say, even our revenues. Uh, for example, in Ethiopia case, the most feasible way of generating revenue is related to YouTube monetization. So if we push those organizations to, to uh, a defensive position without, as a media ecosystem, without doing something to, to counter back, is really uh, damaging. For example, I, uh, I have a, a conversation with uh, Meta people in East Africa. So basically, they are not much responsive for people from the media. Actually, they are not responsive for everything, including removing hateful content. But when it comes to engaging with media, they, are, they have very less appetite to, to, to engage us. So I don't know uh, when, when I, um, I've been in, on Meta for almost for more than a decade. So I, I can see that content from uh, media outlets who publish relevant content are, are, are much affected by the algorithm of Meta. So, I think the media uh, uh, people who are in the media, including CSO, we have to do something other than uh, uh, approaching those organizations in, as uh, it, it, it has been done in Australia and Canada. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Abel. I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, the context and how people are using and disseminating social media varies a great deal, and we need to think about our policies and our positions based on that. Thank you. Uh, Usama, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. My name is Osama Khilji. Uh, I'm director of Bolo B based in Pakistan. So I just wanted to build on what Courtney was mentioning about um, uh, news platforms, especially smaller ones. Um, and I want to share an anecdote. Um, so we know that Taliban was under the sanctions list of the United States because of which Meta put them on, you know, they, were, they would take down content related to Taliban. So come August or July 2021, and Taliban sort of take power and control. Um, so Pakistani news outlet, a small news outlet that's quite progressive <clears throat> in the Urdu language, reported, started reporting on Taliban, and their page was blocked off Facebook. <clears throat> but at the same time, on New York Times, uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani, who is a leader of the Taliban, wrote an op-ed, and that was shared on Meta, but that was in English, so of course, the New York Times page wasn't taken down. Uh, but it just speaks to how there are multiple layers to not only where you're located and the size of your new startup, but also the language that you're publishing in. Um, and I think it speaks to the inconsistency in content moderation when it comes to languages that are not English. Um, and, and, and that then impacts the ability of people to access information and especially independent media outlets like the one that was taken down. And then we had to escalate that. And then it took, I think, a month for their page to come back. Great. Thank you um, for sharing that. I want to pass to Laura Pekana from the Global Forum for Media Development. And I also want to mention that the Global Forum for Media Development is the secretariat for this uh, dynamic coalition. 
one of the issues that um, you know, in particular, that Courtney raised is the lack of data, and and that it, we we want to build networks that can build data so that we have a better understanding of these types of things, so that we can take anecdotes up to a higher level and see what's happening systematically. And Lara is going to talk a little bit about an initiative that this dynamic coalition is going to be doing about trying to uh, get more data from our network. Laura. Thank you, Dan, and like uh, nice to be here today. And yes, actually, and I've been, I've been hearing like uh, also the, the issues uh, with uh, content moderation are, are it's some of the things that we want to address, but not only content, also account moderation. And it is true that when we look at this, uh, platforms really lack these uh, affirmative measures, I want to say, of online recognition of credible actors and accounts. and especially those that are providing public interest information, be it news organizations, journalists, but also human rights uh, advocates, not trying to define, as we were saying, it's difficult to define what it is a credible media. So, but these um, um, uh, professionals, these uh, content creators who are really providing um, public interest information. So we agree, as I've, I've been hearing, that uh, this current moderation system is taking a toll on the sustainability of uh, news organizations, especially as we just say, like non-English, non small and medium-sized media outlets, and uh, so basically also those in the, in the global south, because um, these um, uh, organizations really, or these, uh, these uh, content creators really rely on the social platforms to distribute the information and they often, often also to monetize this this content so it is true also when there is this uh, content on this or these accounts are taken down uh, these uh, media organizations uh, do not have the sufficient capacity or resources to address these unjustified content moderation decisions and at the same time, like, and again, I don't want to go and to get uh, stuck in the debate, like, what is a credible uh, organization? We need this, like, transparency. So we need to be asking transparency for platforms to identify if the takedown was legitimate or not, or like, how many times uh, these platforms have been imposing uh, this restriction or, some, or suspension on news content creators. And this, like, and I'm just gonna come back to Europe now. Uh, sorry for that. It's true that, for example, we see on the Media Freedom Act, uh, which is a regulation that has proposed the European Commission, they have a section on the digital media, uh, well, media in the digital environment, and they have proposed this Article 17.5, which actually asks, like in line with the DSI, DSA, DSA requirements, it actually asks platforms to disclose this information. And that's a basic thing that we need. And it's true that, uh, and what I wanted also like to, to ask and, and request you here, uh, we know many, uh, or some, not many, monitoring uh, organizations or mechanisms that uh, are documenting uh, these adverse actions on, against trustworthy uh, or public interest con uh, content. So for example, we know that the Palestinian Observatory of Digital Rights Violation is also documenting uh, the silencing of Palestinian content on social media, also, we have the digital monitoring database of Bear and Share Foundation. They're not uh, specifically only, they have also, uh, they have white uh, resource centers, let's say, so they collect a lot of cases, but they include some of the cases that we want to kind of like start collecting information. We also have the, in Europe, the map, making, Mapping Media Freedom Initiative by the European Center of Press and Media Freedom, which uh, is like uh, collecting all the cases uh, related to journalism and, and among others documenting the online threats that uh, journalists receive. And we also, of course, we have a mnemonic who is also gathering uh, a lot of uh, digital uh, content that exposes uh, human rights violation. And it also, uh, if I'm not wrong, it offers uh, support reinstating this content and this information online. So. We think that uh, first having the information, so collecting the, the data that, uh, that uh, on these cases, on, on what happened, it's important. And it's also, and it's gonna be also helpful for us to, to identify like trustworthy communities of ethical, credible, and professional news organizations 
that like not only digital native, uh, native uh, media outlets, but also perhaps uh, um, civil society organizations who are reporting on, on, on cases and so human rights advocates and so on. Um, so we want to hear also like from you if you have like if you know any any like regional or organizations who are collecting these cases. If you uh, yes, well, basically if you know if you know any any other organizations that are working regionally, because we as as we were saying, it is uh, a problem that it, it is most usual in non-English speaking uh, regions. So sometimes Great. it's difficult to access. Local. Sorry, that, yes. No, Go great, on. great. <laughs> thank you. Th thank you so much, Lauda. Yeah, you know, so one of the activities that our dynamic coalition is going to be doing over the next year is exactly what Laura has just been talking about in terms of trying to capture this data around how da content moderation around public inf in public interest news is being caught up in these processes and how that is affecting news organizations and also the ability, the sustainability of those organizations. So if you're interested in the chat, you know, connect with Lauda or leave your email or if you're in the room here, connect with me. Um, and I also want to mention that we're still pulling together our Dynamic Coalition's annual report. So if your organization has done research or reporting uh, on, on these topics that we've been discussing today, you do the same thing. Talk to me or, or, or connect with Lauda on, online. We can include that in our Dynamic Coalition's annual report. Um, we have one more comment uh, intervention from the floor, and then I, I'm gonna. I think that it would be really great if we could get uh, just some closing remarks from our speakers, Courtney, Anya, and Mihal. Sorry to put you on the on the spot, but I know we've had a really interesting discussion here, and I'd just love to hear you know just a very brief uh, final comments from you. Uh, before we, we close. So I'm going to pass it to uh, the person here uh, in the room first, our intervention. Please introduce yourself. Thanks, Dan. Um, thanks, everyone. It's been a really interesting discussion. My name's Zoe Hawkins. I'm former Australian government and Amazon public policy, but currently at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, I think there were some really interesting comments made, both in terms of how, as an example, um, Meta's uh, content policy around pornography and, and the broad sort of swathe of content that that's capturing, and then other comments made about how a potential advocacy point might be um, governments um, across the EU, for example, with the DSA around making sure that platforms are held to account on transparency. I think there's just another comment I want to add into the middle of that, which is there's a bit of a feedback loop, I think, sometimes between what governments are putting in those online safety regulations and then what positions um, gov companies like Meta might be taking on their policies. And I do think that the reason, I would hypothesize that part of the reason that that bar is so low sometimes for, for Meta is actually in a re defensive response to the quite aggressive regulation that's coming at them from online safety from some of those governments. So to the extent that people are concerned about um, you know, news organizations or certain social initiatives, particularly around sexual health, are concerned about um, being uh, blocked or having their pages removed, another advocacy point I think would actually be the governments that are putting immense pressure on some of those companies to, in particular I use the Australian example, you know, we're having um, industry codes developed where the expectation from the e-safety commissioner is that, um, you know, there'd be no material uh, that is sort of not child suitable in certain circumstances and I think all those kinds of conversations are possibly leading to, to where those, the overcorrection and the over censorship might be coming from, so just another point of uh, advocacy for those that are interested. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that that observation, that perspective from a, a, a government perspective. Um, now, um, Anya, I'm wondering if you would be able to give us your, your closing remarks. We go Anya, Michal, and then and Courtney, just very briefly, as we only have about ten more minutes. And I'm told here by our staff in Ethiopia, the IGF staff, that we do need to wrap up soon. Great. Um, thank you. I think the discussion is absolutely fascinating and it just shows again how um, difficult policy design is and how many um, sort of exceptions there are to the rules and how different different countries are and different situations are. So I think that it's pretty clear that we're going to find a lot of different answers um, and questions as we proceed. I, I think it's interesting we haven't really talked about Twitter because in the US, that's something everybody's talking about right now. Um, you know, the fact that they've let go their content moderators, that there's many people have told me in the last couple of weeks, there's really no one to call anymore about, um, you know, illegal or hate speech or violence threats that are that are appearing. I think what we're going to probably see is even more fragmentation um, around the world. And I think that in terms of regulation, 
I think the EU is going to continue to play a leading role, and that raises all the points that Courtney loves to talk about and remind us of, which is that these laws are being designed in Europe without necessarily any consideration for how they're going to affect the rest of the world. So I think that it's really important we have these conversations, and um, there's going to be a lot more work for us all to do. I'm really happy that you're looking more into data. Um, I have to believe that a lot of that data exists and it's just a question of trying to get um, big companies to release it. I think the analytics are very developed in many parts of the world and um, you know maybe some of the transparency requirements for the big platforms will actually help us get some of that data that we would love to see out of uh, Meta and Google among other places. So that Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Anya. And I just wanted to put it on the record that there was a big, uh, you know, round of laughter when you men mentioned Twitter, the, the elephant in the room here. So I'm um, going to pass it now to Michal for your uh, just final uh, comments. So uh, I agree about the Twitter comments. I, I see this conversation progress uh, focusing on Meta and Google policies and really leaving Twitter and other uh, uh, platforms behind. And I think it's our responsibility to bring the conversation to all the relevant uh, platforms for the users. Um, and I just wanted to bring to the conversation as a final remark that um, even though I, I absolutely agree, this is a fascinating conversation and there's a lot to do and it's really hard to do something uh, with a global um, uh, perspective, um, but I really value the, the, the all the, the insights we got from this uh, conversation. For me, it's important to to maybe highlight that um, the internet is a fast, ever changing ecosystem. Is um, for the media to have a strong strategy and a strong mission. Um, the, the the center make that is the center of the the livelihood of the media uh, to be able to carry that strategy from one platform to the other. Impact is more meaningful than reach. Reach can be momentary. Uh, impact is everlasting. Working around your community needs and challenges is and will always be the most effective development plan for media and it's really important that we discuss this um, these uh, policies but it's also important to keep talking about the social impact of this media to avoid um, being metric centric uh, and rich centric um, and to start thinking about like the social role of our uh, public interest content etc so thank you very much this is fascinating and I I feel honored to, to be a part of this conversation. Great. Thank you, Michal. I mean, I think that's a really important point is uh, given that we were talking about the power of platforms and what we really, at some point, we want to also more empower news institutions and make sure that they're strong so that they can uh, be more resilient in these changing times. Um, so thank you. And now, Courtney, uh, for your for your final comments. Great, thank you so much. Um, I couldn't agree with Anya and Michal more, but let me just add a couple of thoughts. I do think there is something fundamentally different about Google, Meta, and um, Facebook and the role that they're, sorry, I should say Facebook, Meta, and Google and the role that they play in the news ecosystem today. There is a fundamental difference between Twitter, which is very important because a lot of influencers are there, but they don't own the infrastructure that are embedded into the news organizations and which most news organizations depend on to get their news out. So I think we do wanna be thoughtful about that, but we should expand what we're talking about in platforms um, because we didn't talk about, for example, payment processing platforms. And that turns out um, in some of the research I'm doing now talking to journalists around the world, um, if you're working in many countries, it's really hard to access those financial platforms. So you know, we should talk about platforms more broadly, but also be specific in what we're talking about and how that links to news media sustainability and the internet governance challenges that brings up. I think I just wanna end this conversation by saying how um, delighted I am that this conversation has really advanced in a way in this dynamic coalition, because I think when we started it, it was a little bit of a heavy lift to convince people why 
a dynamic coalition on journalism and news media sustainability belonged at the internet governance forum and trying to explain you know these concept papers about why internet governance fundamentally shapes the sustainability of news and i think that you know between the pandemic um you know the the election issues um you know i won't list them all here but we've all realized that the way we govern these platforms and the internet more broadly has a fundamental impact on news and journalism, which is a public good and which is fundamental to democratic governance and to um, accountable governance. And so it's really helpful to hear this discussion here. I hope that we will see more companies and governments engaging in this dynamic coalition because one of the big challenges, which you know we've all alluded to here, is that you have this proliferation of legislation coming up. I think um, as the, the speaker earlier said that the, the um, e-safety bills, all these online safety bills, this tension between safety for children, um, you know, and countering violent extremism, all of this really can be in tension with the ability of news organizations to exist and sustain online. And so, you know, my core point as Anya alluded to is policymakers just, you need to think about the secondhand impacts on news media because you might be developing something that doesn't seem to have any implications for news but if it's dealing with content online it's going to have an impact and so we need to be proactive in considering what those are mitigating against them and ensuring the sustainability of news media in the country you live in but also around the world so thanks so much dan um, and everyone in the room and my fellow panel Great. Thank you, Courtney. And I want to thank our other panelists, Anya and Michal, for a, a great panel session. Thank you to Wakas and Lauda for also uh, participating virtually online and all our participants online and in the room. I, we also need to give uh, a round of applause for our technical assistants here in Ethiopia who made this all possible. We couldn't have done such an excellent hybrid um, panel without them. And I also want to thank the, the people who are doing the closed captioning for our event, which is really important when we talk about, you know, thinking about issues of inclusion and news and access. So really, thank you for the work that you do. And one more plug for the people who are here. I've been told by the organizers that there's a reception from 6 to 9 in the UN Conference Center, and everyone is in encouraged to come. With, with that, um, this uh, Dynamic Coalition working session is now adjourned. Thank you. Where's our reception, Dan? Uh, uh, Zoom <laughs> breakout Goodbye, room, maybe? <laughs> yeah, we need that. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of the IGF. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone online. Thank you so much. <laughs>